All right, welcome back. So this week again, right, we're not going to look at, at, at the readings in great detail in this pre-recorded capsule. I won't go over what it is that I think is important in the readings. I'll just give you a couple pointers as to, you know, broader ideas that I think arise from the readings and that I think would make interesting discussion points for our live session. So we have this, you know, very interesting discussion of the relationship between Aboriginal culture and electoral property, which inevitably also gets us to ask about the relationship between Aboriginal peoples and the mainstream legal system. One of the salient points, right, in Canada is that we have a section in the Constitution that says Indigenous rights are recognized. And therefore, what that's meant is that various rights that Indigenous peoples have, right, are going to take on constitutional status in Canada. And that's relevant because it's basically going to mean that the government is going to have a much harder time infringing upon them, at least since that you know, provision has, started, uh, has, come into, um, has come into effect. Any right that is not constitutional, the government can take it away without much of a reason. However, for constitutional rights, the government's going to have to have a very good reason if it doesn't, right, some court is going to say you cannot infringe upon that right, which is more important because it's constitutional. Therefore, in Canada, we have this recognition that Indigenous peoples have certain rights that are important and that we've constitutionalized. And of course, that's a recognition of the fact that Canada has been extremely evil with, with its um, Indigenous peoples for hundreds of years, right? We have a history of not respecting them, of, of basically stripping them of their rights, of their property, and so forth. And even quite recently with indigenous schools trying to take culture away from them. Taking kids, putting them in schools without their consent so that they no longer speak their traditional language, no longer have that traditional culture, and that was taught to be a good thing. And that's had very significant effects on indigenous communities, of course, in terms of intergenerational you know, abuse, intergenerational harm that subsists, right, whose, co which, whose consequences subsist, and intergenerational you know, issues that arise from that, such as poverty or various other um, issues. And therefore, the Constitution tries to step in and remedy that historical you know, imbalance. The Constitution tries to step in and protect traditional you know, practices of indigenous peoples because historically right, the government hasn't respected them. And it tries to do so with a very interesting word, sovereignty. Right? It tries to do so by saying your own communal rules or not, you know, like various other sets of rules, subjugated to the mainstream legal system. And again, we have this relationship, right, as we did between religious legal systems that we saw two weeks ago and the mainstream legal system, right? Competing sets of rules, right? Rules that are inconsistent, right? Even legal systems that are inconsistent and that compete for legitimacy. Compete for legitimacy within a state but also ultimately within the lives of the members, right? Indigenous peoples have their own systems of governance, have their own systems of dispute resolution, right? Where they don't need the mainstream legal system. In fact, they were here, you know, hundreds of years before, right? And it wasn't a problem. Resolving their disputes wasn't a problem because their system was comprehensive. But then at some point, right, someone came in and says, we're superior, right? Our system, is superior, and that's still true in Canada to a large extent, right? The Constitution is the ultimate authority in Canada, right? There's nothing above it. Anyone can, you know, do things or start their own system, but it's always going to be subjugated to, you know, Canadian law and the Constitution. That's a problem if we want to think about Indigenous peoples as you know, people who were there before and people who have their own sovereignty, right? Who can and should be able to govern themselves without, you know, this paternalizing influence of the federal Canadian government saying, 
we know better. Or even if we don't say we know better, we have ultimate decision-making authority under Canadian law to decide for you whether what you want to do is legit or not, or whether you get to do what it is that you want to do. And therefore, this recognition of Indigenous rights comes with this concept of sovereignty. It comes with this concept that relationships should be from equal to equal, from people to people, right? And that Indigenous peoples are, you know, sovereign governments or entities in the same way that the federal government is. Of course, Supreme Court precedent hasn't really made it that way, unfortunately, right? The interpretation has been watered down quite a bit, but at least it's the idea. And we have this very long article on, you know, basically how intellectual property law is violent to Indigenous culture and doesn't properly provide tools for Indigenous peoples to do things that they want to do. Of course, the prevailing paradigm is that, you know, it serves, intellectual property serves to protect commercial interests, right? It's all couched in this capitalism, you know, paradigm. In this paradigm where, right, people come up with books or come up with, you know, artwork or come up with great inventions, but they do that, right, not just to help people out, not just to, pr to create, you know, things that are valuable to the human experience. They do that ultimately to make money. And the way that it's expressed that they've invented something important, the way that it's expressed that they've contributed to society is in the fact that they make money. And that might not be a priority outside of that paradigm. It might not be a priority for indigenous peoples. And therefore, right, the author argues that the rules are not adequate because they, they, they seek to achieve a goal that's different and therefore they might be inadequate tools to achieve some other goal or any other goal that is not, you know, prioritizing commercial interest or making money. There's various suggestions to that, right? But it's interesting to see again, right, this idea of a relationship, as I said, between two legal systems. But in the case of Scientology, I told you, right, it is clear that the mainstream legal system prevails. Any autonomy that Scientology's legal system has, any ability that it has to exist on its own, exists, but it's granted by the government, by the constitution, by tax laws that say you get this status and this status lets you do that. And therefore, any autonomy arises from a tacit recognition that the legal systems are not equal, that they're not equivalent. And in fact, that, you know, the mainstream legal system prevails. That shouldn't be the case for indigenous peoples because it's predicated upon this idea of sovereignty. It's predicated upon this idea that it's you know, the federal government and some other people that has its own sovereignty, right? In fact, there's various indigenous peoples in Canada, each of which have their own sovereignty, right? We don't, you know, the constitution doesn't include them as a block, right? So various indigenous communities have their own sovereignty, have their own governance mechanisms, right? But these should be, according to the Constitution, equivalent with the mainstream legal system. And therefore, right, law or the Constitution should give it the same recognition. And so we see in the case of intellectual property, fitting boxes like we did with Scientology, right? Trying to get these labels and these specific legal concepts that the, that the organization can use to do things that it wants to do. And often the boxes are hard to fit, but it's important to fit the boxes to get the benefits. In the case of intellectual property law, we see that it's inadequate. It's not a box that's easy to fit for indigenous peoples. But significantly, right, and unlike what we saw with Scientology, it shouldn't have to fit boxes, right? The boxes should be there, right, in a way that matches what they want to do because they're supposed to be equal under these various principles. And significantly, right, there's this idea of, I think, distrust, right? There's this idea, of course, and again, you know, 
people have all sorts of opinions on this, but generally there is a recognition, as I said, that Canada has been very bad to its indigenous peoples, and therefore that there's historical inequities that remain and need to be remediated. And even though we don't actively have a system, right? Some would argue that's not true, right? But even though we were, if, if we were to accept that we no longer have a system that's actively perpetuating the disadvantage, right? It's not enough to just tear it down, right? We have to make sure that we rebuild this trust because it's not instantaneous. When you take it away, right, people don't suddenly start trusting a system that's been hostile to them for a very long time. And therefore, right, in making these boxes, and I think the author um, from, from um, by making a comparison with Australia and New Zealand, looks at that as well, right? She says, you know, we have to make sure that they fit them, but we also have to make sure that they use them, right? That the boxes that are available, right, don't stay there unused because of historical distrust with the mainstream legal system. Then I made you read this piece by the Fraser Institute, which is this um, right-leaning um, organization in Canada that has various opinions, right? might agree with some of their opinions. I think their opinions on indigenous peoples are particularly bizarre, right, or offensive, right? I might agree with other things they say, but I think these are particularly offensive. That's my opinion, right? You're given this idea that basically the author says, in crude terms, indigenous peoples are poor because they don't have property. It is true in most developed countries that concepts like property and profit seeking, which we saw throughout the term, have led to economic growth, right? Have established a standard of living for most people that is significantly above what we had, you know, three or four hundred years ago. It doesn't mean it's for everybody, and more significantly, it doesn't mean that everybody has this goal of maximizing wealth, right? And in fact, entire peoples might have very different goals. Now there's consequences to, the, to that, right? So the author says one of the consequences is you can't mortgage your house, right? It's not exactly true and not definitely not true as much today as it might have been then. But basically, right, everything in a banking system is based on property, right? You own your house, it's yours, and therefore it's clear that you can give the bank the right to take it away if you don't pay. Right? And therefore, the bank's going to lend you money because there's no uncertainty there, right? The bank knows it's yours. You said they could take it away. And therefore, the bank's not afraid that when the time comes, it is, in fact, going to be able to take it away. When the house is owned by a collective of people or by people that we don't know, right? If it's owned collectively by a community that includes, you know, people who are dead, people who are not living yet, people who are not human, right? Under a community collective conception, well, that makes it a lot harder, right? For the bank to get a mortgage on that. The government's rem remedied that by you know, making various changes to basically what the PMHC, the, the public organization that ensures mortgages in Canada, does. And the author uses that to say, see, if they had property, they'd be rich, right? They'd have houses they could mortgage them and they'd make money and they'd want to make money and therefore they'd get rich. That's basically his point. Of course, right? The countervailing point is that perhaps the mortgage system shouldn't be like that in the first place. In fact, perhaps it makes more sense to collectively own things because we don't destroy them for profit. Perhaps we take care of our house more when we know that it's also owned by other people. Perhaps we take care of our house more when we know that we're only stewards for the next generation. That might be true for the environment as well. And therefore, Perhaps, right, these goals are just as significant, and the problem is that places like the CMHC don't or didn't recognize, right, that there's other ways, there's other paradigms, and that these people should have mortgages as well. More significantly, right, and that's just my opinion, but you see this person from the Fraser Institute, I think, do things that are inimical to the constitutional aims that I've just discussed. First, he says, right, we'll force them to have property. Well, that's not consistent with this principle of sovereignty. It's not consistent with, I think, right, mutual respect, mutual 
you know, regard for, you know, culture or governance systems, right? In fact, it's the opposite. It's imposing a system that they don't want or care for by saying, see, that's going to work out because we got rich off that system. And he basically says, right, it's egregious. He basically, I, I think it's egregious. He basically says, right, we'll stop giving them money if they don't have property. And I think it tells us something about, right, the pull of this historical relationship, the pull of this historical assumption that the relationship is not equal, but instead the relationship is, say, you know, predicated upon one party having ultimate authority, right, under the Constitution or the laws. More importantly, I think that it contributes to this distrust that I've discussed, right? I told you that I don't think it's sufficient to take down various oppressive structures. We have to make sure that we rebuild trust because it's going to be hard for people to trust the system that's been hostile to them for a long time. Well, this very distrust, right? This very distrust it might very well be fed by what you know the, the, the researcher from the Fraser Institute suggests because there's going to be conditions, because there's going to be an assumption that are forced upon them. And therefore, right, it might yield not just, you know, poor solutions that don't achieve their goals, it might contribute to, you know, this historical mistrust of the mainstream legal system, which has very deep and significant consequences, right, being fed again being worsened again.